Now I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rachel Wigginton. She received her bachelor's in biology from Western Kentucky University. And after that, she moved all the way out here to the West Coast to do her master's in biology at Cal State Long Beach. And she also did her PhD in ecology at UC Davis. Her graduate research involved studying the ecology of marshes of the San Francisco Bay San Joaquin Delta estuary. And we'll be hearing about some of that work today. Since finishing her PhD, she has served as a California Sea Grant Fellow, and she also worked as an environmental scientist with the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. More recently, she started as a senior environmental scientist at the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta Conservancy, where she is applying her scientific expertise to the Conservancy's projects. So Rachel, congratulations on the new uh, position, and thanks for joining us tonight to share your work. Oh, thank you so much, and thank you for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Excellent. So I'm really excited to chat with you all today about the impacts of invasive plants on wetland birds. This is my area of expertise, um, but I thought that it would be really nice at first, um, particularly in these virtual environments. Sometimes it can feel a little bit like you know, science talking head. And so that, that really nice introduction that was given um, sort of lays out my journey through my career. Um, but it can seem like a little bit linear, so I just thought I'd throw in a, a bit of color to this. Um, so when I was at Western Kentucky University, I was studying stream and river ecology. Obviously, there's not a lot of tidal wetlands in Kentucky. But I knew that I wanted to work on a tidal system and I wanted to really dig into a conservation challenge. Um, which is definitely true about the wetlands of California. So I moved from Kentucky to California um, in 2009, so over a decade ago, to get my master's at Cal State Long Beach um, before going on to keep studying the wetlands of the San Francisco and Sacramento, um, San Joaquin Delta throughout my PhD. Um, and then finally, like I'm a slightly more tidy person these days. Um, but I'm still really jazzed about all of the work that we can do to conserve the natural resources of California and really our country. And so I think you can see through my, you know, my smile doesn't change much through the years because I'm really enthusiastic about this work and all the different forms that it takes. So back to the conversation at hand, the impacts of invasive plants on wetland birds. Based on that short introduction in the chat, it sounds like a lot of folks are local to the Bay Area and may have some experience with the tidal wetlands of the San Francisco Bay, Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta estuary, but others might be less familiar. So I thought I would talk briefly about the importance of these estuaries and these wetland systems. So first question, what is a wetland? Well, in this case, the name is actually pretty self-explanatory. It's where the water meets the land. So these are areas that are inundated by water for at least a large portion of the year. And the types of wetlands that we're going to be talking about today are these tidally influenced wetlands. So this is China Camp State Park in San Pablo Bay in the San Francisco Bay of California. And you can see here that the ocean tide is coming up covering those lower elevation areas of the marsh. And then you have a nice bed of marsh vegetation that slowly grades into upland vegetation. So really a nice example of where the ocean meets the land in these tidal wetland habitats. But these are also really dynamic systems. Here you have a tidal wetland in the South San Francisco Bay, and the tide in this image is low. So you can see the exposed mud flat area in the top left of the photo. And this is a great habitat for invertebrates that like to live on that benthos, that sediment layer that's exposed when the tide goes out. And those are also really important food sources for birds. So we have this really great exposed mud flat area, and then again, slowly grading up in elevation through those different marsh vegetation types. But in this exact same spot, just a few hours later, the environment that you encounter might be really different. So imagine if you were a small bird out foraging in this habitat, how different your interactions with it would be at this time of the day versus when the tide is low. 
And because of these really dynamic systems, this can also create some really challenging field conditions, I think would be putting it a little bit mildly. Um, over the years, I've had the opportunity to muddily trudge through many of the beautiful tidal wetlands of the San Francisco Bay. Um, and it is, it's a sport unto itself. Um, but in the process of trudging around in the tidal marshes, I've gotten to see a lot of the really unique plant and animal life that lives in these systems. So here are just a couple of my favorite wetland plants. On the left, you have a hemi-parasitic plant, soft bird's beak. And on the right, you have our gum bush, which is a common shrub that we find near the upland edge or right along marsh channels in these tidal wetlands. So lots of really cool plants living in the tidal marshes. Um, and also lots of really excellent animals that are unique to these systems. So here we have the salt marsh harvest mouse, which is a federally endangered species, as well as the tule perch, which is a really important native fish. And we know that wetlands are important habitats, nurseries for small fishes that perhaps are important economically. Um, new studies have shown that marine mammals might be actually utilizing tidal wetland habitat more than we thought they did before. So these are really cool and interesting systems that provide a lot, not just for the natural system, but also for us as humans. Um, not only can we enjoy nature near these tidal wetlands, but they also do a lot of what we're calling ecosystem services. So they store carbon that would otherwise be released into the atmosphere in their soils. They can do things like protect adjacent development from floods. So these are really important systems. And this is why, you know, everyone here has showed up. These are really important systems for bird populations. So wetlands support a lot of different types of birds. Here we have an image of just tons of shorebirds feeding on the exposed mud flat. So this is when the tide is low. And this is, I think, a, sort of an iconic image of what we think about, particularly when we think about the mud flats of the San Francisco Bay. But these tidal marshes support lots of different types of birds. Songbirds, like the salt marsh common yellowthroat. Um, birds of prey, like the northern harrier, sometimes called the marsh hawk. And even these honestly quite adorable secretive birds, like the California black rail. So there are lots of different birds that are supported by these tidal wetland habitats. So obviously really important places, both for nature and for us as humans. However, these are really imperiled habitats. Here we have a map of the tidal wetlands, the historic extent of tidal wetlands around the San Francisco Bay and Sassoon Marsh within California. 90% of those tidal wetlands have been lost in the San Francisco estuary. So much of this area was lost due to development and the marshes that remain exist in close proximity to the built environment and they're also existing in these sort of smaller patches um, which can be harder for animals to utilize. So obviously this is a human dominated system. You can see this really stark transition um, from the 1800s to today. Um, but I do just want to acknowledge that this is a system that has been modified by humans uh, since humans came on the scene. Um, it certainly didn't start with European contact. This research took place on the traditional homelands of numerous different tribes, principles among those being the Ohlone people. Um, and this history of human modification really continues on through today. So here we have a very, what I think, a quite a beautiful tidal wetland in northern San Francisco Bay. Um, but you can see, you know, there's just development right up next to this tidal wetland. Uh, similarly, in this image, even though it's perhaps a little bit harder to see, here we have a tidal channel that has, the tide's a little bit low, so it's not all the way full. And I'm standing, taking this image inside the tidal marsh. And over here, we have a airport landing strip for a local airport. Um, this is actually connected to a wastewater treatment outfall. Um, and you have development right over um, just, you know, 
less than a mile away. So these systems really exist inside of our developed matrix in the San Francisco Bay. Um, so it's a really interesting system to be studying because of that. So I'm, I'm super jazzed to tell you all about, you know, these really excellent systems. It sounds like some folks from the chat you know, go out and experience these tidal wetlands going to their local parks. And if you are not among the folks who have gotten to experience these areas, I highly suggest that you seek one out. There's lots of trails in the San Francisco Bay Area that allow you to really get up close to these habitats. So even though they really are modified by our human influence, they're still really beautiful places that are really important for supporting native species. Unfortunately, one of the other challenges that is presented, not just the fact that we've lost 90% of our tidal wetlands within the San Francisco Bay, we also have a really big problem with invasive plants and wetlands. So just essentially weeds. So wetlands cover less than 6% of the global land surface, so they're really rare habitat types. But over 24% of the world's most invasive weeds are invaders of wetland habitat. So these invasive plants, they are often introduced from other areas, either of outside the country or other parts of the country. Um, and then they're categorized as invasive if they actually cause problems for the native system. And a lot of these invasive plants and wetlands act as ecosystem engineers. So this is a really excellent term to describe an organism that comes into a system and really drastically changes the place. So this doesn't have to be an invasive species. The classic example of this is the beaver that comes in, builds a beaver dam, and changes what was previously a flowing water system into a ponded water system. So plants can do, come in and do those exact same things by changing the types of native plants that are there or the amount of native vegetation that's there. By changing the plants that are present, you can change the foods that are available to organisms that use that habitat. You can change the structure where they might build their nests. So these invasive plants and wetlands can have really big tag on effects to the other organisms that live in these systems. And so a question that I've been asking myself a lot throughout my scientific career is how do these invasive plants impact birds that are living in wetlands? Um, and I will be upfront and say that I, I personally feel like I'm slightly bird adjacent. Um, so I'm extremely interested in the things that birds eat. So organisms like invertebrates um, and you know, other types of organisms that live in the vegetation and in the sediment. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how changes in plants can impact those food items that then impact the birds. We're going to be talking about two different case studies in the San Francisco Bay Delta estuary. Case study number one is the impacts of invasive hybrid cordgrass on Ridgeways rails. And then case study number two is the impact of invasive white top on Sassoon song sparrows. So I'm hopeful to really take some of these concepts that I've gone over with you all about the importance of wetlands and the impacts of invasive plants and really play out the details by discussing these two case studies. So we're going to start by talking about the impacts of invasive hybrid cordgrass on ridgeways rails. Um, so invasive hybrid cordgrass or spartina um, is essentially is a hybrid species between smooth cordgrass, which was introduced from the East Coast in 1975. Um, and that smooth cordgrass hybridized with our native Pacific cordgrass. And this hybrid plant species was essentially able to invade lots of different types of habitats. And it displaced native vegetation. And then it also actually was able to persist in these areas that were originally unvegetated tidal mudflats. So you can see in this image, there's lots of shorebirds feeding, but there's this patch of invasive hybrid Spartina that's really precluding those organisms from feeding in that area. And not only that, um, not only are you losing open mud flat, flat for foraging area, um, but additionally, it was understood through a series of experiments um, that the 
food supply for these birds, essentially the invertebrates, so the worms, the crustaceans, the clams that live in the soil, that the invasive hybrid Spartina was actually causing there to be less food available for these birds. So less area to forage, less food available, not a good scene for these sugar birds. Enter. Um, a control and eradication program run by the San Francisco Estuary Invasive Spartina Project, sometimes referred to as ISP. And this is a group that is funded um, and has helped to implement control and eradication of the hybrid cord grass um, through funding from numerous different agencies, primary among them being the State Coastal Conservancy. So I was actually collaborating with the Invasive Spartina project during this work. And their control and eradication program was extremely successful. They were able to eradicate over 90% of the hybrid cord grass by 2012. So this was a plant that was covering just tons and tons of acres. And so they were doing pretty extreme things like spraying pesticides um, from helicopters and then hand wicking um, the remaining invasive plant. And while these might seem, and I did say they were kind of extreme, these were really necessary measures because of the strong negative impacts that the invasive hybrid cord grass was having, not just on other native plants, but as I said, on the avifauna that was present in these wetlands. However, um, there's always unexpected consequences to our actions, no matter how well intentioned. Um, so we are coming to understand there's legacy effects on the invertebrate communities. So just because you're eradicating the hybrid Spartina, the invertebrate populations might not just pop back as soon as that invasive plant is gone. Additionally, throughout the course of this Spartina treatment program, it was observed that Ridgeway's rails populations declined during this period. And this is a federally endangered species, so that was a big problem for the control and eradication program. Um, and we think it could be just because of the removal of the vegetation from the area. So on the left, you have a hybrid invaded marsh. So this is not ideal habitat for a Ridgeway's rail by any stretch of the imagination. But on the left, you have an area that has been treated to eradicate the hybrid Spartina, and what you're left with is essentially a devegetated area. So also probably not great habitat for birds. So they actually had to halt the control program at key sites where there was a lot of Ridgeway rail activity because obviously you don't want your land management decisions to have negative impacts on the species that you're trying to help protect. Um, and they started an active restoration of native Pacific cord grass. So actually going in and replanting the native plant in an effort to stabilize these Ridgeway rail populations. So enter me. Um, with some research questions. Um, so I was really excited to be able to get in the door right after these restoration plantings had begun because I was interested in if active plant restoration can speed the recovery of these invertebrates that these birds are using as food sources after the removal of that invasive plant ecosystem engineer. So essentially asking the question, just because you remove this plant that we don't want, um, and you put in this plant that was previously there, does that actually, like on what time scale does that actually affect things for um, these organisms that are providing food and trophic support for these birds? So to answer this question, we looked at invertebrate food sources across numerous different sites in the San Francisco Bay. Um, first, we looked at native cordgrass sites at China Camp, Emeryville Crescent, and Laumeister Marsh in the South Bay. Um, all of these places are great visits. I would say China Camp, if you're really into mountain biking and you wanna see some beautiful tidal wetlands, that was probably the way to go. And then we sampled at eradication only sites. So areas where there had been the invasive hybrid plant, but they had gotten rid of it using pesticides. And then we also sampled areas at those same marshes where they had eradicated the invasive plant and then replanted the native plant. So what that looks like in actual life is a little bit like this. So on the left, you have a cartoon of the way that the plants were planted in each of these little plots. And on the right, you can actually see the little baby Spartina plants happily transplanted into the marsh. 
And this was a really successful program. So here we can see that the active replanting of native Pacific cordgrass has really taken off. On the left-hand picture in 2014, that's a year and a half after those plants were planted. And then going over to the right to 2016, three and a half years after these plants were put into the site, you can really see those cordgrass meadows are starting to look really beautiful. Um, so I've been calling this the LOL my thesis result because the first question you have to ask when you're looking at the impacts of these restoration plantings is, uh, okay, did the plantings actually work? Um, so I've been calling this LOL my thesis. So on the Y axis, you have percent cover of plants. And on the X axis, you have the three different years, 2014, 2015, and 2016. Um, and here you are seeing the results for the percent cover of plants. Yellow shows the eradication only sites. Blue shows the eradication plus replanting, and green shows those native sites. So you can see that like very quickly, actively replanting these plants brings them back up to a level of cover that's equivalent to these native sites. So that's great. Alternatively, the part of the plant that's below the ground, so it's roots and rhizomes, it's below ground biomass, seems to be recovering a lot more slowly. And this is the part of the plant that really interacts with some of those organisms that, the, that live in the soil that these birds feed on. So on the y-axis, you have biomass of plants. And on the x-axis, you have those three different years, 2014, 2015, and 2016. Um, and here you can see um, green, again, is the native sites. And then blue and yellow are the two different restoration techniques. And clearly, these native sites have much more below ground biomass than either of these restoration sites. So what does that mean for the invertebrates that are living on and in the soil that these Ridgeways rails are feeding upon? Well, we sampled three different types of invertebrate communities. So really mobile invertebrates, like what you see on the left, those are yellow shore crabs. Um, in the middle, we have a California horn um, snail, which we were calling um, surface-dwelling invertebrate. And then on the right-hand side, you have things that actually live in the sediment. Those are worms that we would actually have to pull out usually at the microscope. So for these three different types of invertebrate food sources, um, we found that replanting really did speed up the return of these mobile invertebrates. So things that can really move around and pick the best place to be seem to really be coming over to these replanted areas. Alternatively, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for some of these other invertebrates, it really depended on which site you were at, how well the restoration planting seemed to be working. And then finally, for these below ground species, it really seemed like their recovery was lagging behind these other organisms. And if you'll remember, the below ground part of the plant also seemed to be recovering more slowly. So that kind of tracks. So, what are the conclusions we can draw from this? Um, so there's a difference in above, above and below ground plant recovery, that much is clear. So above ground plants might recover very quickly over these short time scales, but the below ground part of the plant, its fruits, um, all of those things that are going on below ground, that might take a little bit longer. Active replanting seems to assist in the recovery of some invertebrates in the near term, which is super exciting and good to hear. We're creating not just physical habitat for these birds, but some form of food web support. And we do know that rail populations have been slowly increasing over the past five years. And just in 2018, treatment of this hybrid cordgrass was resumed um, in some of these areas where they had halted treatment because of the Ridgeways rail populations. And we anticipate that in 2020, we'll really understand the impacts of that resumed treatment on the Ridgeway rail populations. So stay tuned on that story for the final outcome um, but for myself, I feel like the restoration plantings have been going really well, and it's a super well-run and well-organized project. And I want to take a moment to um, acknowledge my collaborators on this work from the Invasive Spartina project. Um, Whitney Thornton particularly um, contributed a lot to this project, and then also Ted Groschholz um, from UC Davis. Next, we can hop over a little bit to a different location in the estuary and a different invasive plant and talk about the impacts of white top on Sassoon song sparrows. So here we have the whole landscape scale of the Bay Delta estuary and I am going to take us now 
to Rush Ranch Open Space Preserve in Sassoon Marsh, one of my favorite places on the planet. So Sassoon Marsh is really neat, unique in its ecological value. So it is situated between the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta and the San Francisco Bay. And not just ecological value is driven by the variability that exists in this system. So in this map, you can see San Pablo Bay on the left and the Delta on the right with Sassoon in the middle. And the reds and oranges over the bay represent areas of higher salinity, while the greens and blues over the Delta and Sassoon Marsh show areas of decreasing salinity. So Sassoon Marsh receives these riverine inputs from the Delta and oceanic influences from the bay, which creates these brackish salinity conditions. So not quite fully saline, not really fresh. It's a really unique situation. And in fact, it is the largest brackish marsh on the west coast of the United States. And I feel like lots of folks that live in the Bay Area don't even realize it's right, you know, right around the bend from them. Um, and these variable ecological conditions are reflected in salinity gradients, both north to south and east to west within Sassoon Marsh. And we're gonna focus in on the Sassoon Song Sparrow. So for those of you all who are fans of song sparrows, I suppose you probably know that within the bay, there are three different races of song sparrows. So we have the Alameda Song Sparrow, which um, is represented in the map to the left by that little blue dot um, around the South Bay. We have our San Pablo song sparrows represented by that little red blob in the North Bay. And then our Sassoon song sparrows, which exist in the Sassoon Marsh and are represented by this yellow area. And this is a California species of special concern. They're adorable, as you can see by this um, photographic evidence. They breed from early March to about July. And they eat in multiple foraging guilds, which is really interesting. So not only do they eat seeds sometimes of the year, um, but they're eating animal proteins in other parts of the year, so um, invertebrate foods. So a real mix of food items that these organisms consume. And these Sassoon song sparrows exist in Rush Ranch Open Space Preserve and other areas of Sassoon, um, where the marsh is highly invaded by Lepidium latifolium, um, commonly called white top. So Lepidium is a really aggressive invasive plant in the Bay Delta estuary. Um, it can impact different organisms by altering the types of native plants that are present. It can change the abundance of invertebrates in the canopy versus in the soil. So this is another invasive plant that acts as an ecosystem engineer coming into the system and really changing things. And at Rush Ranch Open Space Preserve, there's a large population of invasive white top. So in this image, you can see Rush Ranch. Um, the facilities are in the bottom left, and or the bottom right, pardon me. And to the left, you can see the historic tidal marsh that exists at Rush Ranch. So much of Sassoon Marsh is no longer tidally influenced. But the Rush Ranch is fed by a large tidal channel, which you can see here, which comes up into these smaller tidal channels. Um, and then finally, Sassoon and Rush Ranch specifically have this really nice area of transition from the tidal wetland to the uplands. Um, this is embedded in a really complicated management landscape. So there's lots of, there's duck hunting, lots of different things going on out in Sassoon Marsh. But it's also an area that's really high in plant and animal species diversity. Lots of really cool birds mammals and plants among obviously also fish. Um, if anyone's team fish out there, there are plenty of really cool fish in Sassoon Marsh. And we know that white top at Rush Ranch, because that population has been studied, has a couple pretty specific impacts out in the tidal marsh. Um, it impacts marsh microclimate, so micro meaning small climate, um, so this is basically, it like changes the humidity and the temperature under its plant canopy. Um, it can reduce the amount of other native plant species that are around, and it can alter the types of native species that are present. So really coming in and changing that basic community of plants that make up the ecosystem. 
We also know that white top cover is correlated with increased presence of sassoon marsh, um, or, or excuse me, of salt marsh common yellow throat and sassoon song sparrows. And that sassoon song sparrows actually have smaller territories when lepidium exists inside of their territory. So this is sort of interesting because I've just described to you that lepidium has these, what I would categorize as being kind of negative impacts on the ecosystem. But here we see Sassoon song sparrows are guarding smaller territories when lepidium is inside of their territory, perhaps meaning that they're able to get enough resources without having to guard a larger area. And this could potentially make sense. Um, some other work that I've done shows that lepidium seasonally alters arthropod abundance, so these invertebrates that live in the plant canopy that these Sassoon song sparrows could potentially be feeding on. So again, we came back with another research question. Wanted to know how invasive white top impacts song sparrow diets. And we thought there could be a couple of different ways this could happen. So soon song sparrows could be directly feeding on lepidium. Um, lots of other native salt marsh plants don't have very many seeds or very big seeds, so not very juicy if you were a bird and wanted to get in there. Um, whereas lepidium has pretty nice big seeds. So we thought that the, the song sparrows could be feeding directly on the lepidium. Um, alternatively, because we know that lepidium changes the availability of these invertebrate foods, we thought, okay, what might actually be happening is the lepidium is impacting the song sparrow food web, but through this mediary of these invertebrate food sources. And we answered this question utilizing a scientific technique called stable isotope ecology. And it's really cool, and I considered cutting it out of the talk, but I, I just think it's super interesting, and I want to give it a go trying to explain it to you guys. So stick with me on this. So stable isotope ecology is actually a really simple idea. It's the idea that you are what you eat. So on this graphic, we have the stable isotope of nitrogen on the y-axis, and stable isotopes of carbon on the x-axis. So essentially, we as humans, the carbon and nitrogen that's in the foods that we consume is converted and used to create the tissues of our body. So myself, as a vegan, um, I don't eat any plant foods, or if I only eat plant foods. Um, so my stable isotopic signature might be down here a little bit lower on the nitrogen and um, a little bit more negative in the carbon um, because of my place in the food web. I'm eating pretty low on the food web. Whereas ovo vegetarians might be somewhere else in this stable isotopic graph and omnivores would be in a completely different place. So by taking samples of tissues, um, so in this case of humans, we can analyze the stable isotopes in those tissues and start to make guesses about what those people are eating. And we can do this exact same thing with the song sparrows. So here we have the exact same graphic. We have nitrogen on the y-axis and carbon on the x-axis. And we have, we know what the stable isotopic signature of our birds are. Hmm, but we don't know exactly what they've been eating. That's the question we're trying to answer. So we take samples of all of the different food sources that these birds could be consuming. We figure out what their stable isotopic signatures are. And then we use math to figure out which of those sources, so like which of those isotopic signatures could be mixed together to make the signature of that consumer or our bird. So it's just this idea that the carbon and nitrogen and the foods that we consume get transferred into our tissues and we can potentially use that information to figure out what organisms have been eating. So to do this, we took sources from our consumers, in this case they were our song sparrows, um, and we took samples, very small amounts of blood, which you can see here, um, and we did this because blood, the stable isotopic signature in blood tells you what an organism has been eating for about the previous two weeks. And this was right before the onset of breeding season, or excuse me, right after the onset of, after the breeding season had ended, I apologize. Um, so we wanted to know what they had been eating while they were actively breeding. Um, and I always say this is kind of like alien abduction, you know, you like catch a bird in a net and then you take it and you, uh, you know, pull some of its feathers off, you take a little bit of its blood and then you release it. Um, a little bit creepy. 
And then we take stable isotopic signatures from food sources. So in this case, we had seeds and different invertebrates that we thought the birds might be directly consuming. And then we also had plant matter that we thought those invertebrates could be consuming. And additionally, um, you know, there could be incidental consumption of when the birds are gleaning invertebrates off of the plant. And then we use mass spectrometry and an elemental analyzer to actually figure out those carbon and nitrogen signatures and then those mathematical formulas to figure out, okay, which of these sources actually goes into this individual's diet. And we were able to, because we sampled multiple individuals, get averages of what basically the generalized diet of these sparrows is. So we sampled at two different times of the year. And in the winter, we found that sparrow diets were about 45% seeds, which totally tracks if you think about what the food availability is that time of year. About another 26% was plant matter, and I put this in quotation marks because these birds would not intentionally choose to eat this plant matter, so that's a little bit of an unknown still. Um, and then a, finally, about another 29% made up of these canopy-dwelling invertebrates. Alternatively, in the summer, when we took summer blood samples and did the stable isotopic analysis, we found that the plant matter was still pretty consistent around like 23%, but now these birds were eating many more soil dwelling invertebrates, about 33%. And then a whopping 45% of the diets of a lot of these birds were made up of this specific invertebrate type, this, these thrips that were particularly abundant during the summer. So we know that the birds have a slightly different diet in the winter than in the summer, which is interesting in itself, but our question was about the impacts of white top on the food web. So how do we determine um, what those are? Well, essentially we break out our isotopic signatures from into two different groups, those that were sampled in the white top and those that were sampled in those uninvaded areas. So we have, you know, available foods from uninvaded areas and available foods from invaded areas, and we do the same sort of analysis. And what we discovered was that the diet impacts of white top are really seasonal. So in the winter, we know that the presence of white top actually decreases invertebrate food availability in invaded areas. So if the song sparrows are interacting with the white top in the winter, they're probably directly eating the white top seeds. Alternatively, in the summer, we know that the presence of white top increases the availability of invertebrate food sources in these invaded areas. So we really think that during the summer months, the invasive white top is having this indirect food web effect on the song sparrows. And that's particularly important because during these summer months is the time of the year when these song sparrows are breeding. And one really interesting thing about Lepidium is that it grows up really tall at the beginning of the season and then it falls over. So it potentially would start off being a really great place to build your nest because there's tons of food available and this really tall, dense canopy. But then later on in the season, when the lepidium starts to senesce and tip over, if you are trying to, you know, hatch a second clutch or something like that, you might discover, okay, this actually isn't a great place to have put my nest. So a few conclusions. Um, we know that lepidium is integrated into the food web of these Sassoon song sparrows. They are utilizing it, particularly in the breeding season. Um, and again, evidence for impacts of this plant, particularly in the breeding season. And so invasion and eradication really need to take place in an ecosystem context. Even though lepidium is causing some ecological harms that we're concerned about, just going in and eradicating it wholesale could potentially cause negative impacts for these birds that are utilizing it for diet and food web support. So that's not to say that we shouldn't go in and try to control the invasive plant. We really just need to think about how native species have started to utilize these invasive plants. And again, we just, we need to eradicate paired with native species replanting to avoid these sorts of issues. So some overall conclusions. 
Invader impacts are highly site specific. So a lot of the different areas in the bay, as we saw, are really different in their um, salinity and their hydrology. So it's really important to know the area that you're working in. And invasive species control should be considered in a whole ecosystem context to avoid these unintended consequences. Um, I told you two examples of unintended consequences on birds, but certainly we could think of others. Um, and then collaborating with land managers can really increase the impact of your science. So I was super excited to be able to do this science in conversation with folks who wanted to use the results to better manage the lands that they have um, powers to manage. So it was a really inspirational time in my life to be able to work with these organizations. Um, so I'd just like to take a moment to thank all those folks. So um, the folks who funded this research and then also the land managers who really graciously gave me access to these areas. And then all of the tons of field assistance that I've had over the years. Um, if you ever want to go out into the marsh, you know, just find a graduate student because folks always need your help. Um, particularly thankful to these four undergraduate students in the Grosch Holes lab, which is pictured at the bottom, uh, the Benthic Ecology Lab at UC Davis. Um, and then I would like to give a final shout out to my collaborators on the Sassoon Song Sparrow Project, um, Drs. Christine Whitcraft and Letitia Grenier and Hilde Spouts from the U.S. Fish and, uh, or the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So obviously science is a team sport and I really appreciate all of my team. And with that, I would be really excited to take any questions that you might have for me. So Lara asked, how does the invasive hybrid cordgrass populate and spread across mudflats since they are hybrids? It's a great question. So a lot of salt marsh plants in general, and this is a hybrid of two um, plants that evolved in salt marshes, they because it's a tidal system, it's not a very good plan in most cases to have seeds, though the Spartina definitely does have seeds. So they're really gonna spread by vegetative reproduction. So essentially, once a hybrid plant gets established at a site, so you know it hybridizes, then it's basically just gonna spread by underground runners. So it, it's a grass. So think about how um, the grass spreads you know, in your garden. It's a really similar phenomenon. And um, yeah, just that, that march down in elevation was that the really problematic thing that folks first noticed about that invasive hybrid Spartina because it turned the mud flat into essentially a vegetated wetland. And Iwe, who is our executive director, asked, are there ecosystem concerns that using uh, herbicides to control invasive species can be detrimental to native plants? An, another excellent question. So there certainly are concerns about that. I will say that there are pretty high standards for the types of herbicides that we can use in aquatic and particularly in tidal systems. So there, there are always concerns when you're utilizing um, any sort of herbicide or pesticide or anything like that. Um, but in this case, these were Essentially, unlike the lapidium, which really exists with an understory of native species, the invasive hybrid Spartina created what we call a monoculture. So it was just hybrid Spartina. So it's a lot easier to come through and just spray a big swath of this invasive plant when you know that's really the only thing there. Whereas it's a little bit harder to do that with some other invasive species that might be more integrated with the native species. So in the case of the invasive hybrid Spartina, it was less of a concern just because we knew, okay, you're really mostly getting Spartina because it exists in these big, dense patches. Speaking of Spartina, Pete asked, um, is it present elsewhere along the West Coast? Yes, so the smooth cord grass, so the Spartina alterniflora from the East Coast, um, it, was present um, in Willapa Bay in really high densities. That's in Washington State. Um, so Washington State had a particular problem with invasive Spartina, um, the same species that hybridized here. But generally, there are 
many different species of Spartina that exist in tidal wetlands all across the globe. And so Spartina, because it's this um, organism that's speciated in lots of different places, but it's still very, they're very closely related. They can obviously hybridize. Um, so when you introduce one from a different area, it can quite readily become in, invasive, was what we found. Um, so Spartina alterniflora, the smooth cord grass, as I said, invaded Washington State. Um, we've had problems in the San Francisco Bay with Spartina densifolia, um, which is another species from the East Coast, um, which is a little bit shorter in stature. Um, so yeah, it is a short answer to your question. Spartina is a baddie and has invaded lots of places, um, but the particular species that hybridized with our native species has definitely impacted other areas along the West Coast of the U.S. Okay, we had a couple of people say that they're glad that you kept in the material about the stable isotope analysis, so Good. kudos on that. Um, Ronnie also said that thrips are really small insects, and so it's surprising that they're a principal food source for a bird as large as a sparrow. In the yeah, I will say that they were just, I, so obviously I didn't share all the details. I sampled those invertebrates by, you reversing a um, leaf blower and sucking invertebrates out of the plant canopy. And there was samples that just had, like I had like literal, when I closed my eyes, I saw thrips. So I was also surprised, but they were, they were there in just amazing abundance. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and now shifting over to Lepidium, Christina asked, what plants would you replace them with? So the good thing about Lepidium is that, as we were saying, the Spartina exists in these monocultures, but the Lepidium generally, it doesn't knock out other species, though it can, um, but it really just causes them to be less prevalent at a site. So one would hope that you would be able to treat and control the Lepidium, and then the native plants that are still present at the site um, would be able to um, find their way back. But obviously, if there was you would consider that on a case-by-case -case basis. So if there was a really dense area of lepidium and you treated it and it, you were like, uh, the veg over here now looks very puny, you might want to augment it with active replantings. Um, and it would depend on where it is in the marsh. So there's lots of really cool native salt marsh plants. Um, there's pickleweed, which is one of our most common plants that occurs at a mid-elevation um, out at Rush Ranch, where we were talking about in those brackish wetlands. Um, there's lots of really cool species that really do like that slightly fresh, but not all the way fresh situation. Um, there's a, uh, like, um, trying to, I'm trying to think of the common names, I apologize, but um, Limonium is a beautiful one, and um, Triglocan is another one, of, that's called Aerograss, I think. Um, so there's many really beautiful native marsh plants that actually do really well when transplanted as evidenced by the great success that Save the Bay has had with their habitat restoration. Um, so that was a little bit of a vague answer, but there's lots of great plants that are, and there's um, really cool development by the restoration community of developing what they're calling plant palettes. So they know like, these are the five different types of plants that I would plant in this area. Um, so they're not just planting like the most common plants, they're really trying to get a diversity of species. Oh, that's cool. And um, C. Hi asked, um, are there other studies that have looked at the diet preferences of Susun song sparrows in areas where lepidium is not prevalent, if there are any places that still exist? Um, not to my knowledge. So there were other studies on the impacts of, or on sparrow diets. So there's been a couple studies on um, Alameda, or excuse me, San Pablo song sparrows in China Camp, for example. Um, and for these other races of sparrows, it was actually thought that they were eating a lot more um, just straight up insect material. Um, so it was really interesting to find that these Sassoon song sparrows seem to be eating, at least in these Lepidium invaded areas, relying on this veg um, to a certain degree year round and more so in the winter when they're consuming large quantities of seeds. Um, so short answer, no, um, but I think it would be super interesting, and we do know that they eat a little bit differently than their closely related um, species in other parts of the bay. Cool. Ben says, awesome presentation. 
Is there a relationship between abundance and diversity of non-native plants and overall bird diversity across sites? Is there a relationship between, I'm looking for that one. Hi, Ben. Um, oh, so I, I actually don't know. So Ben asked, is there a relationship between the abundance and diversity of non-native plants and overall bird diversity across sites? Um, my inclination is that there probably isn't a super strong connection just because um, plant diversity also changes really strongly with the salinity at the site. So those areas in the bay are already going to have potentially less species diversity of plants. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's a super interesting question and um, there might be someone who is interested in mining the data. I feel like we have a lot of that sort of data for this area. So I think that's a great um, future area of research. Yeah, sounds like we're getting a lot of great potential projects for someone to pursue. <laughs> um, Ronnie asked, has anyone specifically determined what was most impactful to Ridgeway rail populations during eradication of hybrid Spartina? In other words, was it the presence of people, helicopters, or noise, or specifically the loss of cover in areas where there was no replanting? That's a great question. So I I think that the generally accepted hypothesis is that the, so our native Spartina, so Pacific cord grass, it really exists in this smaller, low elevation band. It's sort of these like sweet little meadows that exist right along the edge of the mud flat. And those would be areas where Ridgeways rails would come in and forage for food. Alternatively, the invasive hybrid Spartina is really big and robust. So like the biggest Pacific cord grass I've ever walked through meadow came up to maybe my mid thigh. Um, I've seen pictures of invasive hybrid Spartina that was over folks' head. So it just is a, it's growing in this much denser, taller way. So it's colonizing those areas that were previously unvegetated mudflat and covering it in this really tall veg. And then additionally, that hybrid Spartina was able to exist in higher elevations in the marsh. So you're getting, you're essentially creating an area where there's a lot more dense, tall vegetation that would potentially be a really nice place to build your nest. Um, so the thinking is that the invasive hybrid Spartina may actually have sort of increased the habitat value um, for specifically these ridgeways rails in like this situation. Um, and that's the interesting thing about invasive species, right? They come in and you really don't know what's going to happen. So we have this same species that has this really detrimental impact for shorebirds. Like it was not, you know, it really decreases the ability that they have to forage. And that's really important for birds flying down the Pacific Flyway, et cetera. Um, but, you know, when you try to come in there and control it, you actually find out, oh, like animals don't just sit around and do nothing when a new organism comes into their system, they actually start utilizing it. You know, in the case of the Sassoon song sparrows, they're utilizing it as a diet support. Um, but in the case of the Ridgeways rails, it seems like they were really using it as like habitat. Um, so it's a very long answer to a question of no one knows exactly, but it was very clearly correlated with the onset of the treatment. Um, and then the organisms didn't really come back which you would expect if they were scared off by like noise or like a, you know, a, a high activity for a short amount of time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really interesting uh, problem. If you're familiar with the um, willow flycatcher that um, nests in invasive tamarisk, you, um, you know, it's a very similar problem. Um, Dania asked, what ecological research programs would you recommend for students going to UC Davis? Oh, so exciting. So I, um, UC Davis has a lot of really great labs. Uh, I put my Twitter handle on the beginning, so if you're an undergraduate interested in that, you can totally DM me on Twitter. I'd be happy to chat about it. Um, 
it depends on what you like. You know, there's an evolution and ecology department that's got a really great undergraduate major, and I worked with those undergraduates a lot during my research at UC Davis. But I was actually in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy. So it kind of depends on um, what sort of experience you want um, and, you know, what you want to focus in on. But there's honestly just a plethora of, oh, and then obviously at UC Davis, there's the, um, like, nationally ranked um, WFCB, Wildlife, Fish, and Conservation Biology Department. Um, so that's another really great um, place to land if you're looking for uh, an academic home. Nice. And I will be sure to share your Twitter handle in our follow-up email so Thank people you. can get in touch with you. Um, Ronnie, and you, you, um, you did kind of touch on this potentially in your last answer, but Ronnie asked um, why hybrid Sparti Spartina is not as good for rails as our native Spartina. Yeah, so I think I did touch on this a little bit. Um, so the hybrid Spartina really interferes with um, rails, but other birds' abilities to forage, so um, particularly on the marsh surface. So we talked about that exposed mudflat area where lots of shorebirds are going to feed that the Spartina has covered and sort of precluded them from. But more secretive marsh birds, like the rails, really like to get down on the marsh surface among the vegetation where they can still forage, but they're not going to be as exposed as when they're out on the mudflat. So our native Pacific cord grass exists in kind of a less dense meadow, so the birds are actually able to get in there and move around and forage, whereas the hybrid Spartina was existing in these just really dense stands of veg that just had these below ground roots that were almost impenetrable, um, so just not as, and there was less invertebrate food there, so just really a big foraging impact. And then additionally, there were numerous observations of like heavily invaded tidal channels. So areas that had lots of hybrid Spartina in the channels. Um, when the tide would come up, that like extra veg would cause the flooding to be more intense and it could flood out some of those Ridgeway rail nests. So even though I implied earlier that this taller, more robust vegetation could be a good thing for a nest, um, depending on where you put it, could actually backfire. Um, so yeah, definitely the um, impacts for other birds, particularly shorebirds, for the initial impetus for the um, control program, um, but it's, it's a very integrated control program. They're monitoring lots of ecological uh, indicators as they go about this restoration project, so it's uh, pretty exciting. Okay. Uh, Jan asked, how tall is the Lepidium canopy? Did the native plants that were replaced have a similar canopy or form? So the Lepidium is actually pretty different than a lot of the other native marsh plants, which is another one of the reasons that we would consider it an ecosystem engineer, so really coming in and changing things. So it's not only taller um, than a lot of the other marsh plants, um, but it also produces these really honestly beautiful uh, inflorescences of flowers. So it's got all these flowers and all these seeds, which is not common in native marsh species. So lots of times native marsh plants will have little bitty flowers and little bitty seeds because as I said, they're mostly spreading through this vegetative reproduction. So they just don't spend much time or energy on seeds. Um, similarly, um, as I was saying, the uh, the Lepidium can also change the soil environment below its canopy. So in addition to just, you know, being taller, it has a denser canopy because of those flowers. So it shades the soil and can cause it to be cooler and maybe more humid underneath the plant canopy. Um, so it is, it's pretty different than the native plants. Um, Ronald asked, does spraying the hybrid Spartina need to be ongoing? The short answer to that is yes. Um, so it is very difficult to eradicate an invasive species. It's a tall order, particularly when it was as widespread as the invasive hybrid Spartina was. But when there's a really clear negative ecological response to this invasion, folks try to act. And so 
the concern with the invasive hybrid Spartina is because it spreads vegetatively so easily, um, that if, unless you just get rid of all of it, it's just gonna spread back into a site. Um, so there, the invasive Spartina pro program is extremely extensive and I'm just always super impressed by the work that they do because they go out and survey every tidal marsh in the estuary every single year to assess if there is Spartina there and they map how much is there. Um, so I actually feel like if their funding continues they will succeed at eradicating the invasive hybrid and then they won't have to continue treating it anymore. But because it can spread so quickly again. It's really important to treat it consistently until we get the problem completely solved. Otherwise, we're just gonna um, experience like a really quick shift back to the way things were before. Ronnie asked, is it known how long a significant underground biomass takes to establish in native stands of Spartina? Um, your example of the treatments and replanting areas was on a three-year time scale and they're wondering if it's clear yet how long it takes to reestablish the biomass. Excellent question. So it is known to take a long time for a below ground biomass to reestablish in these restoration areas. Um, and we thought that that might be particularly true because of the impacts that the hybrid had on the soil. Um, so I wasn't super surprised to see that the restoration sites hadn't recovered to the levels that the, you know, those uninvaded areas had. Um, but I was surprised that there was essentially, even after three years, no difference um, between the actively replanted in the areas where they had just eradicated. And so from a plant biology perspective, I think that kind of makes sense. You get planted into this area that perhaps the environmental conditions are quite extreme because there's not a lot of other plants around um, to ameliorate those harsh conditions. And so you're just spending all of your energy trying to like, you know, grow above ground material to photosynthesize and to create your sexual organs. And you're probably just not spending a whole bunch of time growing below ground. So my theory is that after, you know, five or even a few more years, we'll really start to see that below ground plant material recovering. Um, but yeah, so I think that between five and ten years for some um, longer term restoration monitoring activities, that's what folks have observed as far as recovery of below ground biomass. Um, but no one had before this directly compared just eradication and replanting within the same site to see how that might um, differ. And so it was really surprising to see that it just didn't make that much of a difference, at least on the below ground community, even in the short Eric wants to know, are you still working on this topic? And if not, what is your current research? So I am, so I have described to you all the Spartina work was part of my dissertation research and the Lepidium Sassoon Song Sparrow work was part of my master's research. And I continued to look at the impacts of climate change on Lepidium specifically during my PhD. So I have studied those two plants really extensively but I'm not actively participating in any research right now. Um, I have transitioned since finishing graduate school for working to working for the California um, resource. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the, um, the California Natural Resources Agency. Um, and I was uh, first working with the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, looking at their Sassoon Marsh plan, um, their Sassoon Marsh Protection Plan. Um, and trying to update that and include best available science on sea level rise and climate change. And as was said at the beginning, I recently transitioned over to a position as the senior environmental scientist at the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta Conservancy. And so our mission as a agency is to restore habitat within the Delta in collaboration with local communities while also supporting local economies. Um, so it's a really integrative agency that I'm super excited to be working for, um, thinking about not just these complicated restoration problems, but also bringing in the human element and really considering that in the work that we do. Super cool work. Um, Robin asked, is it safe to assume that um, M.M. Maxillaris has a larger bill because it eats more seeds in the Sassoon Marsh and needs this bill to crack the seeds? <laughs> 
I think that is a, I think that is a very good um, assumption. So yeah, I used in one of the other versions of this talk, I had put a little circle around its beak and been like, look, its beak is big, um, but it's not as dramatic when you don't compare it to the San Pablo and um, Alameda song sparrows. Um, but yeah, I think that that is um, super makes, that makes total sense. And in the literature before I did this work, there was some speculation that they were eating more seeds because as you say, the bill is bigger, uh, or the um, beak, but uh, no one had, been able to actually bear that out. So it was exciting to um, offer up some empirical proof for that. Very cool. Um, Charlotte asked, I know there are concerns about increases in salinity and the emergence of hypersalinity hotspots in Sassoon Marsh and the San Joaquin Sacramento Delta. Do these changes impact, or how do these changes impact native versus non-native plants? Oh man, such an excellent question. So I could talk about this all day because it's really interesting from the lipidium perspective specifically. We actually found myself and my colleague Megan Kelso that the four year drought that we just recently came out of that ended in 2016, that really extreme drought period, caused the salinity of the water in the bay to be higher, and that actually had a negative impact on lipidium populations in the bay, but it seems to have had a less negative impact on lipidium populations in Sassoon because it is generally fresher there. So we know that there is some interaction between salinity and the presence of some of these invasive species, um, but I think the the answer to your question is that it's a very species specific. So that, um, what I just gave was an example of the impacts of salinity on lipidium, which is an invader of wetland systems, but isn't actually a plant that evolved to deal with these like salty areas. Alternatively, invaders like Spartina that evolved to exist in these fully saline habitats might not be as impacted by those changes in salinity that you described. And those can be driven not just by you know, changes in precipitation like drought, um, but also from changes in sea level, from sea level rise, um, or potentially, you know, alterations from, you know, human withdrawal or, or anything like that. So th those changes in salinity um, come from lots of different sources, and they're probably going to have impacts that are species specific. But it's, a, it's definitely, you're right on track because it is an emerging area of research that people are really interested in. Uh, Lara asked, how was this invasive cordgrass introduced? It was introduced in the 70s intentionally um, as part of a restoration project. Um, we are learning about land management all the time. It's an experiment. You know, we're, we're out here just really trying to do our best and make things better, and this was an instance where somebody made a decision that they thought was going to make things better, and it had really intense unintended consequences. Um, so that's a little bit of a standout story and that it was put here on purpose. Um, the lipidium, we think that the seeds came over in um, some beet sugar um, shipments. Um, well, I think that is the last question I'm currently seeing. So thank you again, everybody, for all those great questions. Thank you, Rachel, for a great presentation. Um, I guess before we log off, does, is there anything else you want to add? Um, I really appreciate everyone coming out and being interested in learning a little bit more about science and birds, two of my favorite topics.